Your Dog's Friend is a nonprofit 501c3 whose mission is to help keep dogs out of shelters by educating and supporting their humans. We promote positive method of training and behavior modification through stress-free methods. As part of that mission, we offer free webinars like the one you're about to watch. Subjects range from dog behavior, stress-free training, and other tools to help you understand your relationship with your dog. If you like the webinar, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Click the notification bell and subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you'll be notified when future videos are posted. We would also appreciate it if you would make a tax-deductible donation to support our mission of providing stress-free dog education resources. You can find a donation button located at the top of our channel page and at the top of the Your Dog's Friend webpage. A link to our webpage along with the speaker's contact info are listed in the description for this video. Now enjoy the webinar. Hello everyone. Welcome to Your Dog's Friends webinar series. Uh, today's webinar will help you train your dog to walk politely on leash and come when called, something that I'm sure all of us are interested in. Um, but first, let me introduce you to our speaker, Amy Glasgow. Amy is the owner and head trainer at Oscar Winning Behavior in Baltimore and a founding member of Baltimore Force Free. She is an associate certified dog behavior consultant through the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, a certified separation anxiety trainer, and a diagnostics fun scent games instructor. So she has a lot of experience in a lot of different areas. Um, please put your questions in chat. We will get to as many as possible. If we start to get bogged down, we're gonna move on and we might be able to get back to your questions at the end. Um, I also wanna remind you about donations. We are a nonprofit. And our free services like these webinars do depend on donations. If you are able to donate, we would appreciate it. You can go to our homepage and there's a donate button in the right hand corner. Or when you register for webinars, there is a donate icon next to each webinar description. Okay, I know that you will learn a lot from today's webinar and I'm turning it over to you, Amy. Thanks, Deb. Uh, as Deb said, my name is Amy Glasgow. I'm actually a certified dog behavior consultant as well as Maryland's first accredited dog trainer uh, through the IAABC. I'm a certified separation anxiety trainer and a fun scent games instructor. And today we're gonna be talking about on-leash manners and recalls. Those are some uh, sort of Achilles heel for, for most people with dogs. And hopefully you'll understand those two things a little bit better by the end of this presentation. So the first thing I wanna say is practice is something that you're just going to have to do. None of the things that I'm gonna tell you today are one and done. I would love to be able to just flip a switch and give you a dog that comes when you call the first time every time. I would love to flip another switch and have that dog walk in a beautiful military heel every time you go out on leash. That's not gonna happen without a lot of practice from you. A recall needs to be practiced regularly and paid well. Your dog really, really needs to believe that you're gonna give them a high value reward every single time. A recall especially is one of those potentially life-saving skills. If a truck is hurtling through space towards your beloved dog, you don't want them to have to stop and think, will they get paid? You want them to hear you and turn and run. You are always going to be competing with all kinds of distractions out there. And you want to make sure that you're paying your dog for how hard they're working, not for how hard you think the skill should be. Just because you think there's nothing going on, if you call your dog and they come to you, they went past a whole lot of smells that we can't perceive. They probably heard things that we can't perceive. You wanna pay them for that potential. And um, most professional trainers I'm sure would tell you a recall, especially you pay every single time. 
um, you'll hear me say this over and over again, the, the one time that you need that recall to come into play, the one time that truck really is hurtling towards your dog, you're not gonna have treats on you. And you don't want your dog to think that might be a possibility. You want every other time you've practiced it for them to have gotten paid and paid well. You wanna think of putting those rewards into a bank so that it is as full as possible before you have to take money back out. A lot of trainers will tell you, you want a, a skill trained to roughly 80% proficiency before you uh, challenge them further. I say for a recall, you want it as close to 100% as possible. Again, with your dog's favorite treats, the best things you can possibly think of and every single time they come when called. First, we're gonna talk about leash manners. Um, know and follow the law, first of all, first and foremost. Leash laws do vary state by state and sometimes, such as in Maryland, county by county. I don't know the regulations for every county in the area. Um, but I do know that in my region, it's a six foot or shorter leash. And um, you need to know where you are and what regulations fit there. For the exercises we're gonna do today, you want a comfortable to hold static leash. When I say static, I mean not a flexi, um, just something that has a measurable length. Uh, some people really like those bungee leashes. I personally don't. I don't have any problem with my students using them. I just don't really care for them. What I personally find is that when the leash has a little give and take as far as how long it is, the dog also can't tell how much space they have before they're technically pulling. And that can be a little bit confusing. When we're dealing with these types of skills, we want to make sure we're as clear as possible as far as what it is we want from the dog. We also want a flat collar or a non-restrictive body harness. Uh, you wanna look at your dog's personal body. There's hundreds literally of harnesses out there. Uh, you just wanna make sure they're not cutting off their shoulders and that they've got full range of motion in there if you do use a body harness. And obviously that a flat collar is fitted appropriately and uh, hopefully we're not dealing with them pulling on that flat collar because we're working to fix that right now. We also want a variety of yummy, yummy treats and a way to hold the treats. Thankfully, mid-September, we are finally getting some cooler weather. So you may have a jacket or something that has pockets on it. You can also pay for a fancy schmancy treat pouch to make yourself feel good about training dogs, but, you know, whatever a treat pouch <laughs> makes you feel. Or you can go down to your local hardware store and get a nail apron for usually a, a buck or so. And um, those are great ways to hold the treats as well. You just want to make sure that you have access to those treats quickly when you need them. The way I recommend setting yourself up physically, you want to hold the leash in your stronger hand and have the length of the leash go across your body so that the dog is on your opposite side. Then your weaker hand is free to gather up the excess length of leash and reward the dog often. As you see from little green person here, um, she, like myself, is right-handed. The leash goes across her body, her treat pouch is on her left hip, and then she's got that hand where she can either treat the dog or hold excess leash if needed. You'll also notice she's got her arm bent a little bit there. That's about where I hold my leash as well. It's my elbow is sort of bent in half there. And that's where my hand is comfortable when I'm holding the leash. I'm making a point to, to bring that out because if you are aware of where your hand is, then you know that if your hand moves, the dog has pulled. So if your hand is set right here and your hand moves forward at all, you know the dog has pulled. You don't have to guess, did they pull as hard this time? Or maybe they didn't pull as hard as last time. And it's a, it's a much more black and white way of describing things rather than, again, that guessing. The less we have to guess, the more we can give the dog clear guidelines 
the more quickly they're going to understand what it is we want. Likewise, you don't wanna reward the dog for pulling at all. So if your hand moves, stop walking. Stop walking means we are no longer rewarding the dog with a walk. Most dogs like walks, it's fun. It's one of the only times most dogs get out and get to explore areas other than their own regular space. And if we keep walking when they pull, we are rewarding them with something they want for behavior we do not want. So again, if they pull, you stop walking. Treat your dog using the hand on the side you want your dog to walk on. If you treat your dog with the opposite hand, they will cross over in anticipation of getting your treat. Technically, that's not a, a big deal. However, for that to literally not be a big deal, you'd have to be a lot more graceful than I am. And while I fully admit that is completely possible, the fact is if your dog has to cross over to get the treat, there's a good chance one or both of you is gonna take a tumble there and we don't want that to happen. Traditionally, dogs walk on the left-hand side. The only reason for that to my knowledge is it stems back to the medieval period when we needed our sword arm free. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess that none of us hopefully need sword arms free in this time. So it does not matter if your dog walks on the right or the left. You just wanna be aware of things, set things up consistently so that my dogs know they get their treats on the left-hand side of my body. They don't have to cross over and look and see if there happens to be a treat on my, the right-hand side of my body this time. And a personal mission of mine is proper leash holding. You wanna make sure you're holding the leash safely. Hook it over your thumb and grip it with the four fingers as you can see in these images here. I know more than one person who has broken bones in their hand from wrapping the leash around their hand and having the dog pull suddenly and jerk the leash. It does not look as stable. And for about five minutes, it doesn't feel as stable. But after that five minutes, you'll realize it is significantly more secure to have the leash hooked around your thumb and gather up any excess with the other four fingers of your hand. I always get the question when I have little tiny dogs, how do I treat them? Because they're down there by my ankles and everybody else's dogs is up there by their knees. And there's, there's a lot of great ways we can do that. And there's some big benefits to them as well. Uh, and additionally, if, even if you have a taller dog, these are great benefits for winter time, especially when you uh, hand a dog a treat and get a little bit of slobber on your fingers in sub-zero temperatures. It is bitterly cold. And uh, these little short dog solutions here can help with that as well. You can use a piping bag. You can use a uh, silicone squeeze tube that you might put shampoo or conditioner in. You can use a wooden spoon and those gather up just enough treat in them. You obviously put all the treat in the piping bag or the tube. You can hand it down and give your dog one lick of treat rather than having to break something up like a Zooks into you know, 14 little pieces that uh, a Morky Poo would be able to eat for a reasonable period of time. Um, whoops, excuse me. You can make sure that they're just getting one lick of food. What can they eat? Most dogs like peanut butter, cream cheese, canned food, yogurt, any combination of those things you can blend them together. You can toss some kibble in there. You can toss some higher value uh, meats and other things in there and water them down with chicken broth or things like that until you get that kind of paste consistency that you want in order to uh, squeeze out of that piping bag. And of course, if you've got that wooden spoon, you stick your spoon in, you tuck your, <laughs> your peanut butter jar in your treat pouch, you don't even have to do any heavy prep work beforehand. So when we're walking, what's polite varies. When we're walking our dogs on a busy sidewalk, 
we obviously want to keep them closer to us. If we're walking in the, in the city or any place where there's people walking by, that's when we're going to want them in that more uh, heel like position. It doesn't have to be a formal heel. It doesn't have to be militant by any means, but we do want them closer to us for a lot of reasons. Uh, when we're just meandering around the suburbs, we can let them have a little more leash. And then of course on, on hikes out in the wilderness, we've got a lot more leash, so we don't need to worry nearly as much. Depending on where we want them as we're walking, that's gonna make a difference as to what training method we're gonna use. And that's okay. It's absolutely fine to pick and switch and, and mix and match the different methods that we're gonna go through today. I have several different games that we're gonna go over and you may find that some of them really click with you and you may find that others, not so much. And that's okay. Try them all out, see what works. You may also find that some of them work for some dogs and some others work differently for other dogs. So this is my personal favorite game. This is um, my own dog here. Um, this dog, uh, bless his heart, he is sweet as pie and almost as smart as one. This is literally the first time he has ever done this exercise. So I promise if he can do this, so can your dog. Uh, I'm gonna go through the method first and then I'll show you video and I'll talk through again what we're doing here. I really love teaching this when I have either a married couple or siblings that I'm working with because there's a natural competitive nature between those two pairings that, um, that really help me out here. But the first step is for the first 30 seconds, you're going to give your dog as many treats as you can with the leash in a J shape. One of my previous students called this jaywalking, which I thought was really clever. We just want proof that the leash is loose. I don't care if the dog is sitting, I don't care if they're lying down or standing or looking at you or looking at something else. I just want as many treats delivered one at a time as I can get within about 30 seconds. Once I've done that 30 seconds, I'm gonna take two steps back and treat when the dog follows. Then I'm gonna take two steps to either side and treat when the dog follows. From here on out, every time I treat my dog, I'm gonna treat him along the seam of my pants. So you can watch here what goes on here. And because he's so perfect, sweet little Linus actually does exactly what a lot of dogs do. And I'll show you what's going on. So you, this is, you can hear an audible sigh as I am confused that this dog manages to miss a treat that I placed on his tongue. Um, but here he is going for as many treats as I can give in 30 seconds. And that is one happy little pit bull tail, isn't it? This is what he's been training for his whole life, just being fed food. Good. So there's the two steps back and he follows. So he gets more treats. I take two steps to one side. He follows. So he gets more treats two steps forward. Now I'm feeding pretty close to the seam of my pants. Good. And look at that. I've got a dog walking in heel. Now he does hear what a lot of dogs will do, which is he comes to the wrong side. Look at that. No treats happen there. So without me saying anything, he finds his way to the magical left side. That's it. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. Um, I cut the video just before he knocked the camera over in excitement that he got fed for a minute straight. But it's, it's very basic. Uh, you just have to gradually build the distractions with that. And those, the magic 30 seconds at the beginning tells your dog, if I hang out with this person, she's going to hand me a ton of treats. I want to hang out here because this is where all the cool stuff has happened. It's really simple. Uh, this is my go-to for teaching dogs, and I find it to be uh, effective for a vast majority of dogs out there. Another way of teaching loose leash walking are a couple of pattern games. So um, the pattern games were de developed by Leslie McDevitt. She is a wonderful, wonderful trainer and an even more wonderful human. Uh, if you uh, aren't familiar with her, you should make yourself so, and you can look up her books and DVD series called Control Unleashed. 
one of my favorite games is called Super Bowls. And if you saw my um, webinar several months ago now on getting dogs, uh, multi-pet homes, I believe was the official topic. But um, in that video, you, you, you would have already seen this video that I'm about to show you, but it's a good, uh, good depiction of Super Bowls. So what you're teaching is you've got rows of bowls or plates or some other visual uh, object set up that you don't mind your dog eating from. Then you're going to place a treat in one, let your dog eat the treat, and then wait for them to look up to you for more. So you walk up to a bowl, put a piece of food in it, the dog eats that, and then they're going to look at you and say, okay, where's the next one? When they look up at you, then you move to the next bowl and place a treat there. You keep doing that. Um, that's it, really. That's the whole exercise here. And I, I like this video because we've got two dogs here who actually have a history of fighting each other. We have a, a three-legged Jack Russell and a little pit bull mix uh, who have fought in the past. And uh, this is one of the things we use to get them to get along together, but it's also a great way to teach loose leash walking. So you can watch this video of both dogs doing it The benefits of these bats, and one of the reasons I bought them is they're bright and easy for you to see. <laughs> so good, wait her out. Yes, that was really good. So Presh looked at Apple a couple of times, like what's she doing? but she's not overly worried. She's got something super chewy. Would you give her chewing gum? <laughs> Good. Good, nicely done. Yeah, so the shorter grass is easier for Apple. So you may go to a place where there's pavement until Apple really understands. She's starting to get it though. Good. And again, what I like about this is they're doing dog stuff. They're moving around, they're, but they're not fixated on each other. It's a great game to play and you can practice it on your own without the other dog. But when they're living together, it's not going to be about you guys sitting there 24 seven, ready to treat them every time they glance at the other dog. So we want to get them to the point where they're like, yeah, she's walking around. It's okay. One of the ways you could make this even more challenging, and this is not an inside thing because I think you'd need more space, is put those dots further apart and have Apple weaving in and out of the pattern while pressure's going up and down the line. Okay, this is another of uh, the pattern games. This one's called Voluntary One, Two, Three. The video goes really quickly, so <laughs> I'm gonna explain the game and then we'll play the video again. It's very, very similar to Super Bowls. And in fact, I very often start dogs on Super Bowls and then move to voluntary one, two, three, because Super Bowls has that visible target to it, uh, where, where somebody's putting the food down. In uh, one, two, three, you're just using a verbal cue. And you start by saying three and then give your dog a treat. This, for some reason, always confounds people. I think it's so simple. They don't really believe that's all it is, but it really is say three and give your dog a treat. Repeat that. I usually say five times. That's a pretty arbitrary number. You repeat it until when you say three, the dog's ears prick up or they look at you or they give you some signal that yes, they know that three is a good word. It's sort of like uh, loading the clicker. If you're familiar with that process at all, then you're going to say two, three and give your dog a treat. And again, repeat that again, roughly five times. Then you can probably guess what comes next, right? One, two, three, and treat. What you're doing is telling your dog, when I count to three, I'm gonna have a treat. So then you count your steps out loud. One, 
two, three, and treat at the seam of your pants after three each time. In the beginning, you can stop at three, wait for your dog to catch up with you and treat, and then wait for eye contact to tell you it's okay to go on. I think that the one, two, three, I sort of liken this to somebody calling your name out when you're in a club where if you're in a crowded area and somebody yells Amy from across the room, it's such a common name. I'm kind of going to go, oh, I think I just heard my name across the room and then keep going with what I'm doing. And then if they call it again, I'm going to go, wait, no, do they mean me? And I'm still not likely to turn around but I'll be a little bit more in tune. And by the third time they call my name, I will actually turn. And I feel like that's what happens here. You say one, two, three, and we've taught the dog. One means, hey there, I'm talking to you. Two means I'm about to do something you should pay attention. And three means, and here's your treat. You can gradually extend the time between your counted numbers. We count steps because we like that rhythm. You can count paces so that you're counting every time, for example, your right foot hits as opposed to right, left, right. You can also count sidewalk squares or fence slats or trees or cars. It doesn't have to be any particular thing. And in fact, it doesn't have to be any particular thing. It can just be arbitrary counting. You can just sort of count randomly. But the idea is still one, two, three, and tune back in. And if you look right here, this dog has gotten so good at the tune back in that she practically can't get the eyes off of her here. So there, look at how cute that little icy is there. Good. Another great method for loose leash walking. This is a great one if you've already got sort of specific behavior issues going on. That's the PREMAC principle. PREMAC says that an opportunity to engage in more probable behaviors will reinforce less probable behaviors. Clear as mud, right? What that means is use activities they were gonna do anyway as rewards for the activities you want. It's also called grandma's rule. The idea is it's sort of like saying you can't eat your ice cream until you eat your Brussels sprouts. Um, this right here is not a video of it being used for loose leash walking. This is actually this past week in my uh, scent games class. This adorable dog here, Norbert, is ready to do scent games. He loves scent games. And as you see, he could easily pull his uh, very tiny but very sweet owner right off of her feet. And so we use Premac and tell the dog, if you make eye contact and connect with me, then you can go sniff. So Becky does a great job of holding her ground and letting Norbert pull a little bit and wander around and flirt with the other students and all kinds of things here. And when he finally looks at her, that's when he's allowed to go to work. Good, and then that's when he pulls her off the leash. Cause again, the goal here was not loose leash walking. It was uh, doing the scent games. And so we wanted to make sure for scent games, we use it to say, hey, I know it's your nose, but we're still a team here. But um, the, the activity can still take place for loose leash walking. And here are two examples. Uh, if you have a squirrel chaser, reward a few steps of appropriate walking with a few steps of running after squirrels together. You would be surprised how well that works. Additionally, got a hound? <laughs> Reward leash manners with a chance to sniff. You wanna think about anything that is your dog's favorite thing to do. What would they pick to do over any other activity? I know half of you are going, ah, eh, sleep, but no, there's something else, right? There's something they like to do. Fetch, tug, anything like that, those activities can be the reward for the behavior you want. Uh, so you want your dog to walk on leash. You want your dog to walk in a heel position, make them heel three times and then throw a ball and they'll go get the ball and bring it back to you and then make them heel three more steps and throw the ball again. It's that sort of thing. So again, it's 
The same thing as positive reinforcement. The difference is instead of handing over food, we're using an activity. That's not a difference from positive reinforcement. It's a difference from how we think of positive reinforcement, where we normally think of trait training specifically. And then this is a great skill. This one I call the twofer because it actually qualifies for both sides of our presentation today. I have often said, if you can only train your dog one skill, if that was it, you could say, I'm gonna teach this dog one thing and absolutely nothing else, you should make that a nose touch. In order to train the nose touch, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is choose a distinct hand pose. I have several examples here of possibilities. You're gonna hold your hand approximately two inches from the dog's nose. When the dog reaches their nose to your hand, yes, when, not if, because 99.9% .9 of the dogs I've ever worked with will reach their nose to your hand. And the ones who don't, you can smear a little bit of food on your hand, try again, and then they will. When they do that, you say yes and feed. So this is my other dog who has never been trained this particular skill before. I'm gonna claim that the reason my dogs are so untrained is because that way I get to use them for webinars when I need certain skills and not because I'm lazy. So um, this is Elfie and she has never learned this skill before. My daughter was running in circles around me as I was filming. So please ignore the adorable giggling. Yes. So she puts her fingers down, Elfie reaches out, touches her nose. And the instant her nose touches Hillary's fingers, yes. she says, yes. And now she's done it just enough that this dog who is smart can <laughs> go, oh, you want me to touch your nose? And so now look at that. We've got a two feet recall for this dog and she's gonna add a cue next. So she said yes. touch, good. So now we've added in moving back a little bit to get a little bit of distance there uh, to use it to teach a heel. You would hold your hand at the side of your leg, sort of in that uh, along the seam of your pants position and go from there. I, um, I mentioned this is actually how I taught Linus to walk on leash. So the first dog of mine that you saw hadn't been trained in that method of doing loose leash walking because he knew this method. So I can hold him in a, a heel position by putting my hand out there. And he puts that enormous muzzle on my hand repeatedly. Um, why would this be the only skill I can ever teach? Because I can get my dog off of my chair using it. I can get dogs in or out of cars using it. I can have them going back and forth between two hands and entertaining vets, uh, entertaining dogs in vet waiting rooms if there are such thing of that anymore or any place I need to entertain them briefly. And as we saw, I can teach them to come when called or to walk in heel. We're gonna switch over to coming when called now. Do we wanna cover questions? I can't see any questions, but Deb, did you have yeah, questions? Let me, let me ask you a few things. Sure. Um, one person was curious what to do with a uh, husband and wife team where one is right-handed, one is left-handed. Do they both try to walk the dog on the same side? Um, someone suggested that they have different cues for each side which might be good for anybody. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah, so <laughs> the, the running joke for dog trainers is the answer to every question is it depends. And I'm gonna say that here. Um, it sort of depends on how strong their dominance is, not in the relationship, but in their handedness. Um, so sometimes they might feel comfortable doing it a certain way. I think as long as they are consistent, it doesn't really matter if they switch. The dog absolutely can tell the difference between husband and wife or wife and wife or husband. I mean, it's it's not even a gender thing, um, but it's um, the dog can learn with this person. I walk here and this person I walk there. Will it go a little bit more quickly if you both walk on the same side? Yes, but by a little bit, it's all going to depend on your individual dog and how quickly you all train things and uh, how consistent you are with doing that. 
you'll notice I did not give a cue to the behaviors of walking appropriately. You certainly can. It's just sort of what I expect from my dogs. So if the leash is on and we are moving forward, I expect you to be walking appropriately. And so that is the, um, the, the method. That's my cue. <laughs> right there. And in fact, that's another way you could do it. You could say when I'm walking in this harness, I walk on the left side of my person and I'm walking in this collar, I walk on the right side of my person. Dogs can pick up on those sorts of cues as well. So there's a lot of options out there. And I don't think that there's a blanket statement of um, the husband and wife need to be paired together or that they need to do opposite things either. Okay. Then I noticed something in the one, two, three video that I want you to, to talk about. The, the woman in the example, she was holding the leash away from her body and she was reaching across her body to get how I would do it. Yeah. Freedom. And I wanted to, I didn't want that to be an example that people would remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can only break one habit at a time. <laughs> Um, and a lot of people just find that muscle memory is really tough. If she's used to reaching across her body to reward the dog, then that's sort of what happens. It's not what I recommend. And um, I definitely recommend adjusting things as soon as possible. But in that case, it was more important that we got the dog to stop pulling than that we worry so much about crossing in front of her. Okay. Um Mary is saying that her dog pulls insanely hard to greet other dogs. If she's doing loose leash training, should she just pull him away, get him to sit, try to distract him? What do you suggest? When it's so specific like that, that it is targeted towards other dogs, um, you might look into a reactive dog class because um, assuming that the dog walks appropriately outside of the presence of those other dogs, then the reactive dog class would help. What I would do, um, assuming that's not the case, is get some distance from the dogs. If you can get enough distance, the, do the dog can walk appropriately. Again, great. Um, but I do not allow my dogs... It's sort of like I said, when they're pulling and you reward by walking, by continuing walking, if you continue going closer to the dog, you're rewarding your dog for behavior you don't want by giving them access to the other dogs. So I say in order to get closer to other dogs, you need to behave appropriately. I need you to be in whatever position I deem as appropriate. For me, that's not necessarily a heel position, but it should be at least um, a loose enough leash that I'm not being pulled. It should be uh, four on the ground. I don't want you lunging at the dog. I don't want you, you know, yanking and, and jerking. I don't want you barking at the dog, things like that. Um, so it kind of depends on, again, whether or not this dog is capable of walking appropriately outside of other dogs, or if, um, if this is going on and it's just worse when there's other dogs around. I also I don't like the concept of pulling your dog away. Right. Um, I, I tend to phrase it as if we're pulling the dog away, I don't, I don't want to pull him away. What I say is move in the other direction and get as much space as you possibly can. It's not a correction. It's not a yank on the collar. It's we're going this way because that's what I need to do to get space. And then you are, as soon as you're back in contact with me, you're going to get rewarded. You're going to get everything you can as soon as you're able to function again. But I also can't let him continue to lunge and bark inappropriately in access of those things. So mm -hmm. you need to get space somehow. Um, and again, it's not a correction. It's not a yank on the leash or anything like that. If you just turn and walk, um, unless you weigh a hundred pounds and you have an Irish wolfhound, chances are just turning and walking is gonna be enough to at least get the dog slightly moving in your direction. Yep. Um, now, Rochelle got a new dog today. Congrats. Congratulations. And she has two questions. One is, 
Does she start with training right away or let him get settled in? And the other question is one I love. Is a retractable leash not good to train? <laughs> um, yes, yes. And it <laughs> depends. Um, so, <laughs> so um, do you start training right away or let your dog get settled in? Um, yes and yes. You let your dog get settled in. Do I start training sits and downs? and um, a military heel and all kinds of trick training when I have a brand new dog? No. Do I start with whether or not the dog is going to be allowed on the bed, whether or not they're going to be allowed to jump on me? Um, I'm going to do things that management wise prevent the behaviors that I know I'm not going to find acceptable like jumping on me. So I may have the dog on leash so that I can hold him back from jumping on me or something like that. That counts as training. Management does count. Um, it's just not specific uh, reward punishment planned out things, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily do a training class at this point. I'd probably give him a couple weeks at least. Um, there's sort of a methodology that one says two weeks and another says three weeks. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I say it depends. It's all going to depend on the dog and your life and everything else that's going on right now. Um, so and I also how old the dog is. Yeah. How old. The, I mean, just, just everything really, it depends. Um, and so, yes, I would start managing behaviors that I know I don't want. For example, lunging at the food bowl when I'm trying to put the food bowl down. Um, and I, I say lunging, not in any aggressive way, just in a doofy baby dog hungry kind of a, a way. I'm still not gonna let that happen because that could potentially be dangerous. Um, I sleep with my dogs, so I have no problem with dogs on furniture, but if that's something you're not going to allow in the future, um, then setting them up so that they cannot get on the furniture now that again, that's training, but it's not, um, nothing hardcore. Um, and what was the other question? Oh, uh, the flex flexi lead. Um, I'm not a fan of them personally. Mostly I find them really physically uncomfortable to my hand and very difficult to control the length. I don't know how long, the leash is and neither does the dog. And so if I've taught the dog, you can walk five and a half feet from me if I have a six foot leash, I can't be sure that my leash is five and a half feet long. Um, they definitely have their place for um, you know, hikes in areas where I can let my dog 20 feet away from me and not have to worry about it, um, where I might not, I personally prefer long lines uh, again, because I feel like I've got a little more control. They're a little more comfortable in my hand, um, for things like, uh, walking on streets in cities and places like that, where I'm far more limited in space, I don't recommend them ever. Um, but yeah, for things like off leash, not off leash, but like off space, uh, hikes, um, they're certainly fine. They're just not my choice. Okay. Um, here is a dog who has turned this exercise into a game. If my dog pulls, I stop walking and wait for him to have a, a loose leash, then start walking again. But he thinks it's a game. So pull, stop, loose leash, walk, pull, stop, etc. We end up stopping every few steps. Yep. We call that yo-yo dog. So what you, <laughs> you've taught your dog very well to go to the end of the leash and then come back to you for a treat or to come back or wait until you um, until you carry on to stop there and wait there. So what you do there instead is you can sort of lure them along. So they go to the end of the leash, they come back to you for the treat, and now you take two or three steps before you feed them. Um, that way they go, oh, it's actually walking with you that gets the treat. It's not going to the end of the leash and coming back. And the same thing goes here. So now, even if you sort of fight through it and the dog pulls to the end of the leash, waits for you, you take one step and make that dog really pay attention. Don't assume that the dog, once they've stopped, is going to 
carry on because we know he's not. We know he's playing the yo-yo game. So if he pulls to the end of the leash, you stop. Then when he stops, you can take a smaller step than usual. And he, you're going to get to the point where the dog goes, oh, I actually have to pay attention to this person back here. This is actually not a fun game for me. So I'm actually going to start to learn to walk appropriately. Um, what do you think of a gentle leader for training? I'm fine with them. Uh, some dogs are comfortable with them right away. Most dogs are not. And as I mentioned earlier, I am lazy and I'm sort of of the opinion of, with my own dogs that if I'm going to have to train them to acclimate them to the equipment to then help me train the loose leash walking, I might as well just train loose leash walking. That said, they can be very helpful in the case of especially very large dogs and small owners because they control the head instead of the full body. And there has been a very interesting study that states there is uh, a correlation, not causation, but correlation between puppies who are trained to the gentle leader and uh, staying in homes and not being rehomed. I don't know what that means, but it is an actual study. And that was an actual result of that study. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I'm fine with them. I don't tend to train them, but I have worked with clients who use them and they're, they're absolutely fine. And what about dogs who on their walk stop to eat anything and everything off the ground? That's a different issue and that you want to train, leave it um, and um, work on that and also work on uh, where you're walking, which I know if you live in the city can be kind of tricky, but um, yeah, that's really more of a, a different training of teaching them leave it um, or something like that. Okay. Um, and someone else mentioned that you didn't bring up when the dog leaves himself. Do you let them sniff and pee first? Do you, how does that fit into this walk? Oh, gosh. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I mention that I'm lazy. I'm only out there because I need my dog to pee. No, um, so, no, of course, I let them sniff and pee and eliminate. And um, some dogs are a little bit more private with that than others. And I, I'm always amused when owners comment that to me because they say, you know, oh, he's really picky about where he pees. And I always say, yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> That's not weird. <laughs> That's just normal. Um, yeah, absolutely. Peeing and, and eliminating and things like that are appropriate. And, um, and what dogs are supposed to do on walks and clean up after it and, and go, <laughs> I guess. You, can, you, you learn to read your own dog's body language and see, oh, wait, that sniffing is a pee sniff as opposed to that sniffing is just bad leash manners. Okay. Um, I think, well, this is another good one. And then we're going to stop for a while. Do you pick one of those games at a time? Do you do different ones together? Which one do you start with? Yeah. As I said at the beginning, I, you, you may sort of pick and choose and see, um, I do tend to do Super Bowls and lead that into um, voluntary one, two, three. Although my go-to for Leash Manners, 95% of the time is that jaywalking, the first video that I showed you. I know that I did go through all those really quickly, but my understanding is you all will get a, a recording for this. So you'll be able to go back and look at them again. Um, but I find jaywalking to be the most practical and most effective for most dogs across the board and um, and owners as well. But yeah, you can sort of pick and choose and see. Uh, and, and your dog should pick up on it pretty quickly in a simple, comfortable environment. This is not a, um, we do this once and then we head out to, you know, the inner harbor of Baltimore at, you know, in the middle of some festival with all kinds of stuff going on. But if you're starting the game in your living room, the dog should get it very quickly within that session. And if they're struggling within that training session of five, 10 minutes, then you might go, you know what, let's try this other one next and see. Okay. 
Um, let me see if there's anything else that's related to everybody. Um, oh, I, I think I know. Our rescue is part hound and, and likes to sniff. How much should we let her sniff versus getting her to keep walking? I like to say there's three kinds of walks. There's the 11 p.m. You've got a potty and I've got to sleep. So I'm going to put you out on a long line and I'm going to stand there and hope the neighbors don't see me in this ridiculous outfit that I'm wearing. Um, and you pee and we're going to go back inside. And then the second walk is um, we're going on a walk and I've got 30 minutes before I have to leave for work you know, back when people left their homes for work. Um, and so that's when I need you to pay attention to me because you've got a set landscape that I have to do. And, um, you know, there's a, a thing that I have to do. I have to get back for. The third kind of walk is the dog's walk. And that is, we're going to go out and, um, especially in the case of hounds, but all dogs really, uh, we're going to go out and if you stop and sniff this bush for 10 minutes, then golly, we're going to stand here and sniff this bush for 10 minutes. And then when we're ready to move on, we're going to do that. So every walk doesn't have to be the same. Every walk can have a different purpose, depending on what your limits are. Um, as far as the answer to how much should you let your dog sniff as much as you want to, but please be kind and remember that that's really, really great enrichment for all dogs, but especially those that we genetically programmed to want to love that. Um, so th there's no problem with letting them sniff. Uh, if you think back to that slide I had at the beginning, that was the sort of concentric circles. Um, there's different types of walks. We don't need a dog in a heel the whole time. If your dog is sniffing along next to you and just not pulling you over, that's absolutely fine, provided they're not tripping other people and knocking into other people and things like that. It's absolutely fine. It doesn't all have to be on heel, looking beautiful, you know, people just bowing down in awe that your dog walks so beautifully. It can be a more relaxed, let the dog sniff walk as well. Okay. I know I said I was going to move on, but there's <laughs> more that are really good. <laughs> I, I love this question. What are your thoughts about meeting and greeting other dogs while on leash? Uh, not a fan. Um, you dog, and others. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, dog body language wise. Um, well, two main things. One is that as a dog trainer who specializes in aggression and specifically in dog to dog aggression, the number of times that I have had someone say, my dog really wants to meet yours and he's friendly. And I've looked and seen a dog that truly was 100% friendly. I can probably count on one hand. Most people just sort of can't conceive that their dog is a predator. There's nothing wrong with your dog being a predator. It's what dogs are. It doesn't lessen their value as a pet. It doesn't make them any less wonderful to you. It just means that maybe they don't need to meet everyone they see. Um, the other thing is, even when the dogs are appropriate for meeting strangers, when you watch two dogs interact, when two strange dogs or, or dogs who know each other come in contact with each other, they do so very sideways. They look away, they turn their heads away, they turn their shoulders away. Uh, a super friendly dog may get sort of a C shape to their body where everything is very curved and sideways. And when you compare that to one, how human beings greet, if I were to go up to you and shake your hand, like the olden days, <laughs> um, if I were to go up to you, I would be very square and front and I'd make eye contact with you and I, I'd be very forward. And that would be how I exuded confidence and told you that I was a friendly person. And if dogs meet that way, it means, hey, you want to fight? And when we put them on leash, and they're pulling towards each other, they are squared, making eye contact very forward, that looks to humans like friendly posture and to another dog looks like a threat. So um, generally speaking, my go-to answer when I am walking my dogs, if somebody says, can my dog meet yours, is no thank you, we're training. And then I ask my dogs for something like a sit 
and prove to them that my dogs are training because look, they sat out here in public and everything. And um, I have never had a problem with that. Usually I've gotten, oh, okay, thank you. And uh, the person carries on their way. But, um, but no, I'm, I'm not a fan of dogs meeting off leash that I don't know. Um, and in my experience, most dogs aren't either. Okay. Um, Mary Sue is a 65 year old with low bone density. I will not use your last name, Mary Sue. We'll keep that between us. And she has a high prey drive, 75 pound dog who she said walks nicely on leash until she sees a squirrel or bunny. She ends up dropping the leash to prevent her falling. Yeah. Um, any ideas about that? Um, it's, what I would recommend is something like pre-Mac. Um, and that's going to depend on Mary Sue's ability to run with the dog and brace herself. Um, so that might be something where hiring someone to help with the dog, depending on your ability to run with the dog, um, that might be more effective to have someone, um, if the dog sees a squirrel, then, okay, walk two steps appropriately with me. And now we're going to chase a squirrel for three steps or something. The math doesn't have to be two versus three or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of going to depend on other physical limitations that I don't know that Mary Sue needs to get into here, but you can certainly email me um, if you want more help with that. And you'll have your information on the last. Yes, I will. Yes, okay. Um, oh, this is interesting. How to teach them to potty quickly. Uh, we've been trying, but she takes forever walks, at least 20 minutes before she'll pee, longer for poop, and uh, this she'd love a quicker walk before bed? Um, so one, you probably inadvertently trained that yourself, um, the longer potty breaks by um, turning around as soon as she did her business. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens is the dog's enjoying the walk, they go to the bathroom, you turn around and end the walk and they go, oh, well, then I'm just going to hold it as long as I possibly can and make this walk last longer. Um, so <laughs> good job training that. That was, look at that. <laughs> um, but the way to fix that is um, start seeing if you can get the dog to eliminate before the walk starts, by which I mean, um, find a, uh, a, an area right near your doorway that you don't mind if the dog goes to the bathroom or something like that. Um, also making sure that when they do eliminate on every other walk, there's plenty of time after the walk that that does not mean, okay, now we're turning around and going back home. Um, and adding a cue to going potty, the one that I never use, but always wish that I thought to use. Um, my uh, friend and fellow local, tra local trainer, Lori Luck uses hurry up, because quite frankly, we all say that anyway, and then some. Um, so most of us say like go potty or something like that, but I feel like hurry up is so much more elegant. Um, but yeah, if you can start adding a cue to the dog going to the bathroom and then again, making sure that their elimination didn't signal the end of the walk because that essentially punishes them um, by taking away the walk from the behavior you wanted. Yeah, and then the walk is the reward. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, um, here's a dog who, when they get close to home, the dog decides she wants to keep walking and she plants herself in the sidewalk, even lies down. That is one of the toughest issues <laughs> I've seen. Um, it, it is a frustrating thing. When I have seen it really, really blatantly, like we cannot get the dog to move, um, I, I have even asked other trainers this because it, it is just a really difficult issue. Um, general consensus is that there may be pain issues and I am not a vet, so I am not prescribing or diagnosing anything here, but you want to make sure that you mention that behavior to your vet. Um, but if there are no pain issues, you want to look into things like mixing up the walk so that they don't know the path. Um, if there's a consistent place or distance where they start to stop, which doesn't quite make sense, but I hope you know what I mean. 
um, if there's a consistent, any consistency to that, if you can sort of um, foil it by changing the direction or changing the time or something like that right before that period where they, um, where they lie down and just give up. Um, and uh, doing things like that nose touch to get them started again and reinforcing there. If you take treats with you on your walk, which hopefully all of you are doing, using lower value treats until you get to that point and then higher value treats from there on out uh, to really make it worth their while to keep moving. Uh, like I said, it's a really tricky issue and I definitely recommend mentioning it to your vet um, just so that it's on their record and we can keep an eye on that. Okay, these guys are giving each other great advice. So why don't we move on? I will get back to these if they appear. Absolutely, yeah, we can go back to those at the end too, yeah. All right, okay. so now, now we're into leash manners. Again, I say know and follow the law. Don't have your dog off leash when it's not legal. Um, even if it is legal, please don't have your dog off leash until their recall is very, very solid. What do you need for the games we cover here? Your dog's highest value treats and that's it. You want what they love the most. That might be real chicken, that might be liverwurst. I have a friend who orders an extra pizza, chops it up tiny and puts it in the freezer whenever she gets delivery because uh, her dogs love pizza and <laughs> training treats. Um, I want to be one of her dogs because that would totally work for me. But whatever your dog loves is what you want to use. And then as far as what the actual word is, um, it doesn't really, really matter. You wanna make sure that um, it doesn't sound like anything else your dog is using. If your dog's name is Harry, probably don't use here, things like that. And it doesn't sound like other skills that you're asking for. Um, but I've had people use salmon because that doesn't sound like anything and it's their dog's favorite food so they could remember it. It doesn't have to make any sense at all. You just have to remember it. Uh, you do want to avoid poisoning that cue. So if you call your dog to you, make something good happen to them every time. I'm gonna say that again, because it's that important. If you call your dog to you, make something good happen to them every single time. So when did we used to call our dogs? When we were calling them away from play, when we were bringing them to the vet, when we were trimming their nails, when we were yelling at them for peeing on the floor, all of those things made the dog not wanna come anymore. They hear the word come and start to panic. Um, from now on, when we call our dogs, when they come to us, we make something good happen to them. It is easier to teach a new cue than it is to unpoison an old one. So if you used to say come to call your dog and you would then trim their nails so that they no longer come, just switch to a new cue. That's why that person used salmon. That wasn't something she chose on her own. It was that she had already poisoned, um, poisoned cum for her dog. So you wanna make sure that if you are not going to do something they love, uh, you're going to them. You're making sure that every time you call your dog to, the, to you, you make something good happen to them. The first way of teaching recall is how I've taught both of my uh, pit bulls recall. It, um, it's the easiest way, it's the least complicated. And um, I have gotten both of my pit bulls to drop wildlife that they have caught in their mouths and turn and come running to me. We pick the keyword in my house, it is come. We pick our dog's favorite treats. And when the dog is right next to you, you say that Q word and give the dog five or six treats. It really is that simple. You want the dog to be very, very close to you. You don't get a lot of repetition in if you have to wait, the dog, wait for the dog to run across the yard. 
you don't get to do um, lots of practice. You just say the word, give the dog five or six treats, and then repeat a lot. You're gonna gradually increase your distance from the dog, keyword gradually, and then use the word when the dog is running to you anyway, such as up here uh, when the dog is playing fetch and reward heavily. You can also use the word when you're about to put the dog's meal down in front of them. So come, here's your dinner. Um, we use a whistle as well at my house. Whistles can be heard at a greater distance. They stand out more against background noise and it sounds the same whether or not my husband or I are blowing the whistle, whereas he and I don't have very similar speaking voices at all. So all it is, is essentially we're saying to the dog, this word means mom has a ton of treats right by her feet. Gosh, if only there were a dog here to eat them. Uh, and the dog learns that pretty quickly and, and starts come running to you. This is another one of those um, pattern games by Leslie McDevitt. This one's called Whiplash. It's actually named after a dog, not after any injury. So no one should be hurt here, but you put a treat at the dog's front feet. While they're eating that, you step quickly to their tail. As soon as that treat is gone, you say your cue word. And then when the dog turns to you, you reward by putting the treat at your dog's feet and repeating. I like this game in addition to the one I just did because it gets my dog turning away from something and I get that full pivot from the dog. So um, this is uh, Ryder's first time doing this exercise and here you go. One, reset. Come. Good. And you can see he's already starting to turn back to her and that's okay. Good. So you still, you still did get that 180 degrees. Come. Good. You don't have to be quite as dramatic with your placement of the treats. It's, it's very elegant, but unnecessary. Good. That's why he thinks you're asking for a down because your hand is so big right there. Yeah. Okay. Just drop one. Good. Now spin around. Come. Good. Come. Still eating that one. That was big. Good. Only say it once. I know it's hard. Come. Good. Come. He's <laughs> he's got a twig stuck in his mouth. Come. Like, that treat was like grass. Come. Come. Good. Come. Good, now you can start spacing them out. You can sort of, next time he turns, you can put it a little bit behind you. So he has to go get it. And then you've got a little more time to get over on this side. Cause he's gonna be faster than you every time. Come. That was the dramatic placement you did. Come. Now say come. You're feeding and you wait until he turns to you to feed, to feed. We're not luring him. Now he's like, now I don't know which one to get. So yeah, so you put that down there. While he's eating that, go around to the other one. Come. Good, that was it. Now around. Come. Yes, there you go, good. Okay, good. Um, and you, as I said in there, as, as he figures out the game, you can start um, tossing the treat behind you and that should give you time to sort of run and get a little bit more distance from the dog. And sorry guys, we're trying to figure out a plug system here. <laughs> All right. Um, and th that'll give you a little bit of space there. Um, all right, uh, another one is the Banshee Scream. I think this one is probably the most common one that I've heard. Um, this is sort of in uh, every description of how to teach the dog. And it's, um, it's a great one for, um, for making come, making a recall into a game for the dog as well. So you can see it up here. She does a really great job of turning this into a game. You can't hear anything in the video, but 
Now the dog is turning and running and following her. Most dogs will play chase. And if they do, you can uh, reward heavily. Um, so again, it, it makes the dog think that the recall is fun as opposed to, oh, she's gonna trim my nails and that sort of setup. So, um, so that's a, a simple one that you can mix in at any point. Again, I wanna stress with all of these skills, the more consistently you pay the behavior, the more consistently it will be performed. You can use that equipment as a cue, which I mentioned before when we were talking about the married couple. Uh, one harness can mean a manners walk, one can mean a sniff and wander walk. Uh, you can have any combination of things. Dogs absolutely can tell the difference between those. They know what different things mean as far as what they're wearing on their body and they can get used to it. Uh, I recommend practicing recalls at least once a day, at least. And when I say practicing recalls once a day, I don't mean set aside an hour of practice. I mean, come put your dog's meal down. Boom, you've practiced it for the day. So it can be that simple. It can be that quick. Um, but the time that you need your dog to come most is the time you don't have treats on you. So you need to have that bank filled up in advance. Here. So this is Rick, who you can't even see. He's so far away in the woods. And uh, his owner, Nick, says here. And there comes cute little Rick. Um, and then here's a beagle, because yes, hounds can be recalled too. And there she oh, comes girl. running. And both dogs get treats, because again, you want to feed them as often as possible. And then just here's a quick, lovely little follow-up of... Rick can also walk nicely on leash. Look at that. So that's pretty much it. Um, as I said, if you need more help, if you've got some specific questions, then you can certainly reach out to me by email. Um, myself or the two trainers who also work with me would be happy to, to give you help, either um, some quick help in email or um, some more, more personalized help in private sessions or um, one of our other classes as well. And while we're doing questions, I also want to make sure I thank uh, your dog's friend one more time for having me today. Oh, thank Let's you. Those last minute questions. Okay. Um... Should you use the dog's name before the recall command? Um, yes, and <laughs> it depends, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it, I, I like to teach the dog two things. So come means come over here. But for example, if I say Elfie come, that doesn't mean Linus come over here. So they, they know the difference. Um, and that's how I use their name. As far as just coming when called, I. If I say come and I did not say their name, they don't get to ignore that. It's still, you need to come when called. Um, it just sort of clarifies if there's more than one dog out there who I'm talking to specifically is what I would use their name for. Once the dog is trained with the cue, do you ever stop giving him treats? And if so, how do you know when to stop? Why would you? You're going to feed the dog anyway. Why don't you make it worth your while? Um, especially for something like a recall. Uh, no, I plan on re I plan on feeding my dogs really well for the rest of their life every single time they come when called. And that's why I can get them to let go of wildlife that they have in their mouths. Um, for something like a sit, I pay them every time. I don't necessarily feed them every time. Um, both of my dogs are well enough trained and sit is easy enough skill for them that they can get a scratch behind the ear or um, something like that. And that is rewarding enough because that's a small enough reward for a small enough skill. Again, something like come when called. Mm -mm. Nope. I'm paying that for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how do you practice recalls off distractions, squirrels, people, dogs? It's got to be really, really solid before you even try it. But what you can do is set up little distractions like food in the house. Um, 
You can have a uh, call away from somebody who's giving the dog cuddles. You can call away from um, different food that's on the ground. You can practice a recall on a leashed walk where when the dog sees something like another dog or a squirrel or something like that, they're on the leash, they can't go get it, but you use that recall word. And if they could look at you, here, have a thousand treats. So you're still practicing that come when called, which again means mom has a whole bunch of treats. I wish I had a dog to feed them to. So <laughs> it's, um, it's about using how the dog perceives the training to our benefit. I also pointed out in chat that the, the Banshee game that you were talking mm -hmm. about, is a really good way when you're on a walk and your dog is distracted by something, instead of pulling, you can make that noise or happy talk or, you know, yeah. walking with your mouth or something and run, make it fun. Right. And yeah. then you have a better shot at getting them away from what you want to get them away from. Yeah. Um, my dog likes to grab and pull on her leash while walking usually toward the end of the walk. How can I stop that behavior? Um, you, well, you can put a small stretch of PVC pipe on the leash. Um, and it, the, when the dog bites down on that, they, um, they don't usually find it terribly pleasant, but it, it doesn't, um, some dogs do, but it doesn't, it saves the leash, it spares the leash. You can also use two leashes so that um, if the dog bites down on one, you drop that one, because it's very hard to, um, there's a game happening there, right? The dog grabs the leash and they're like, oh, look at this, I got a free game of tug out of this. Um, so you can drop one leash. You can have a tug toy with you if you know that's gonna happen. If the dog does play tug normally, you can uh, have a tug toy that you whip out before that happens. Um, so that you can keep them distracted that way. So there's a couple different ways you could choose. And how do you handle it if your dog does not respond to touch or come using a high value treat, but we definitely need, me, ugh, need more practice to prevent inconsistent response when something else is more interesting? Yeah, you just answered it. You need more practice. So you've got to do that practice in a really low stress environment. Um, for some reason, people think that practicing calm when the dog is three feet away from them in their own living room is cheating or not really practicing. And it absolutely is. Uh, and in fact, you're sort of setting up a precedent for the dog that what you've got is more valuable than anything else in the environment. So um, lots more practice at a stage where the dog is not turning those things away and then very gradually expanding to the more challenging environments. And that looks like it's about it for questions. Although whenever I say that, somebody else asks me. 47 questions come flying. Uh -huh. What kind of greeting would you say is acceptable for well-known dog friends? Our dog will often sit very politely when he sees them at a distance but when they get close, he will suddenly excitedly lunge to say hello. Does he, I mean, it sounds like he already plays off leash with them. And if he already knows the dogs, then he knows that that's what they're fine with. Um, as far as limiting dogs greeting each other, it's really, uh, we worry more about dogs who don't know each other because just like with people, there are different um, social structures and different things that dogs do. Um, there's introverts and extroverts. I'm an introvert. If you walk up to me and hug me and kiss me first thing, I would find that really weird. I also have um, family members who would find that perfectly lovely and appropriate. Uh, one of my dogs would find that perfectly lovely and appropriate. And one of my other dogs would find that really weird. Um, so it, it's about knowing what the other being, person or dog, is comfortable with at that time. And when you don't know the dog, you obviously don't know what they're comfortable with. If these dogs know each other and are fine with the, the lunging and being obnoxious, then that's, that sounds like that's fine to them. If you're asking what you want, <laughs> then, that's, then that's up to you. If you're asking what's appropriate for the dogs, then as I said, it sounds like it's appropriate. 
if you're asking what's appropriate for you, that's up to you. You can say, I need you to keep four on the floor until we are three feet away from them or until I give you a release word or something like that. But um, boundaries like that are what, what you need to decide is what you are comfortable with for your dog. And she says that sometimes he seems to assume that all dogs can be greeted that way. So make him sit if he doesn't know them. Um, I would, I would have him walk past and not greet them. Yeah. Um, so not, not a sit, but just no, you, you don't, you don't get to meet every single person. Um, so that may mean you need to up your um, leash manners and having him walk appropriately. You might want to do one of those games that has him walking closer to a heel position. Um, you might want to uh, treat more heavily when you're walking past other dogs so that his attention is more focused on you. And Mary, keep in mind what we, we people tend to think that it's fine if our dogs meet other dogs. What's the big deal? But besides it not being a good habit for your dog, the other dog may be reactive. The other person may be trying to control their dog. It just makes it, makes it so much harder on the other handler with the other dog. Yeah. And we don't usually look at their side of things and, and we really need to start to. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that human beings don't walk over and greet every single person we walk by on the street. And again, we don't think that that's weird. And yet for some reason, we've decided that dogs need to greet other dogs and they don't. Um, I'm a very friendly person. I'm, I'm very generous with my time. And when I walk past someone on the street, they get a smile, maybe. Um, and that's it. And that's socially accepted. That's fine. And that would also be fine for dogs. Your dog is perfectly happy walking past other dogs, provided you tell him this is what is, is accepted here. We don't need to meet every dog out there. And here's a question that comes up in every webinar. Chantal wants uh, tips on managing weight when treating high value i.e. high caloric treats when using lots of treats? Uh, two things there. One is that high value is not necessarily high caloric. Um, it, it is often in humans, but um, a, just plain chicken breast is significantly higher value for almost every dog I've ever known than um, a uh milk bone <laughs> or something like that and is significantly healthier and not as high calorie. Um, so there's that. The other thing is you want to treat every training period. Um, and that includes walks in which you're bringing treats with you. Think of it like Thanksgiving where you don't go to Thanksgiving after having had a full breakfast and a full lunch, you know that we're going to have this big meal. So I'm going to factor that, that caloric intake into the meals I have for the rest of the day. And the same thing goes with training, which is I'm going to say, okay, you know what? We took a really long walk and he got an, a whole lot of treats here. I'm going to cut back or maybe not even feed him dinner because he's gotten the calories that he needs for the day. Another way of handling it is if your dog likes their food enough and you are asking appropriate enough skills of them, you can use their meals in their training. Now, for something like loose leash walking past distractions, that's most dogs aren't gonna find their kibble high value enough. And for something like a recall, I'm gonna tell you their kibble is not high value enough. Um, but for most things, again, like sit or down or things like that, that are fairly simple for your dog, you can probably use their kibble and just say, oh, I was going to feed him two cups today. I'm going to take that pinch of kibble out of those two cups. Here's an interesting question. Um, how do you keep your treats on you? Her high value treats are not what I want to have crumbs sticking around in my treat bag like minnows. Um, mm -hmm. especially stink and, but even hot dogs and cheese. There are some great silicone treat pouches now, um, that we, I just put in the dishwasher. 
Yeah, you can wash a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of treat pouches you can uh, hand wash, especially if you get like one of those cheap nail aprons that I mentioned earlier from a hardware store. You can throw those in the wash regularly and there's not even any um, clicks or anything that can get damaged like some of the fancier treat pouches. But yeah, um, you can do silicone treat pouches or you can just do a plastic baggie, um, you know, a little like Ziploc type bag inside a regular treat pouch so that you're taking the whole thing out but still using the basis of the treat pouch itself. Um, here's another good question. What do you think about an emergency recall word or should they all be at the level of emergency recall? Uh, my dogs know the difference between come, which essentially is their emergency recall. Um, there's also come here. Um, there's let's go inside. There's a bunch of different things, all which mean come here or come back to the house and the urgency with which I expect response is the difference there. Um, so yes to an emergency recall word. I just, um, I train it the same way that I've trained everything else, which again is the highest value and rewarding every single time. So for my dogs, when I say Oscar Elfie, I'm not, I was gonna yell it and I was like, I don't have anything on me and they're gonna come running, so I won't. But if I yell it in a stern enough way, to, you know, to make my voice carry across my yard, they know they better turn around and come running to me. And when I say they better, it's not because they, there's any punishment that's going to happen if they don't, it's because I've got a handful of goodies for them. Um, whereas if I say, okay, let's go, or something, they go, oh, okay, I've got time to finish peeing. I've got time to sniff a little bit more. I can meander my way back, things like that. Um, here's someone with a springer that has a 20 foot tie out in the yard mm -hmm. and she pulls us from the front of the house to the back where the tie out is located um and she's saying it sounds like she should use the three exercise to get her to calm down when going out there oh i see okay so the you go out the front door with the dog on leash in order to get to their tie out sounds like it Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think the um, voluntary one, two, three would be a great way of doing that. Um, and can you recommend a kind or brand of whistle? Um, not a dog whistle. Um, other than that, no. Um, Cause I don't know the brand I've gotten whistles that they say are like for hikers or something that can be heard for two miles or something. The reason I say not a dog whistle is because if it breaks, how do you know? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, if, if something goes, yeah, so if something goes wrong, I can, I'm, I can sit there and, you know, blow till I'm blue in the face and the dog still can't hear anything. So I want to know that I've made the cue. Um, I, the, what, the whistles that I have gotten, as I said, I've gotten them off of, I feel like probably Amazon. And I think they're called like hyper whistles or something like that, um, that just they're loud. Okay, um, we have two questions and my husband probably would be a third <laughs> to do about marking. One one to know about a dog and one one to know about her cat. Okay, um, they're both far more complex issues. Um, mm -hmm. Vet check and first uh, because marking is frequently a medical issue. Um, if it's not a medical issue, then it is frequently a stress issue. So at the very least, ask your vet for a full medical exam and also check on things like anti-anxiety meds and whatever would be needed. Um, often vets will say blood work is needed before starting the animal on anti-anxiety meds. So you want to broach that possibility with them. Um, without knowing more, I can't really say more other than that the first step would be a vet check. Um, both for medical and stress issues. And I think that's it, other than my question that I will ask you later on how you get the dog to go back and forth like he's chewing the bone. But um, it was great having you. This was a really good presentation. Good. A lot of thank yous in chat. Thank and you. We'll have to get you back again. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Amy, and goodbye. Thank you. Everybody.